So if it's so cut and dry, then why does it never seem to go away? There are a lot of reasons for that, most deliberate attempts to cloud the waters. The pharaohs like to try to point out problems with the techniques of the investigators, usually in the investigation by the Yale New Haven Hospital team. Barrow's lawyer, who once said the Yale team was the best, criticized the report. The Yale group, comprised of two social workers and a pediatrician, has issued a report which is incomplete and inaccurate. As much as they might try to advance the idea that the Yale New Haven team was somehow discredited and incompetent, the truth is that they're very highly regarded and they still exist today, and the same doctor, John Leventhal, who was in charge of Dylan's investigation is still in charge there today. You could spend a couple hours just reading about all the awards he's won and the accomplishments in his 47-year career. I mean, seriously, the guy is about as respected and expert in his field as there possibly could be. For the pharaohs to pretend like he's somehow discredited or incompetent or both is an insult to him and also an insult to the intelligence of anybody who can look him up and find out anything about him. But the pharaohs would say that somehow in this one particular case there were a bunch of amateurs who didn't know what they were doing. Trying to poke holes in one investigation anyway ignores that the other independent investigation in New York reached an identical conclusion. There's two quotes that I want to talk about specifically because they're the favorites of the anti-Woody camp and you'll see them quoted all the time out of context and used as conclusive proof of Woody Allen's supposed guilt. The first is the quote by the judge in the custody case, Elliot Wilk, who said that Woody's relationship with Dylan was, quote, grossly and appropriate, unquote. And the second is the Connecticut State's attorney, Frank Mako, saying that he had, quote, probable cause, unquote, to prosecute Woody, but that he chose not to to save Dylan further trauma. You'll hear variations on these two quotes, but it's basically these two phrases, grossly inappropriate and probable cause, that people seem to think constitute a smoking gun. Out of all the endless back and forth about the case, your average internet commentator has the mental real estate to retain a total of about four words. So first, the idea that Judge Wilk denied Woody custody based on his supposed grossly inappropriate conduct towards Dylan. First off, he didn't permanently deny Woody custody. He delayed it for six months, during which Dylan was supposed to go to therapy to deal with everything that had happened, and then it would be reevaluated and visitation could possibly begin again. He actually said that, quote, the evidence suggests that it is unlikely that Alan could be successfully prosecuted for sexual abuse, which, while he didn't dismiss the possibility in the same language that the investigators had, is hardly the same as saying that he thought that it had happened. Wilk also granted Woody visitation with Ronan, and after six months, the reevaluation of Dylan did conclude that seeing Woody again could possibly be good for Dylan. Moses was older at the time and allowed to choose for himself whether he would like visitation with Woody, which he declined for reasons that he later said were more to do with pressure from Mia. So at the time, visitation was far from conclusively prohibited, which you would think would be the case if this judge had reached any type of conclusion that Woody was molesting the children, which is what the pharaohs tried to imply that he was saying. So then what did he mean by grossly inappropriate? It was based on the comments of the child therapist Dr. Coates. Another thing the pharaohs often repeat is that Woody was supposedly in therapy for inappropriate behavior towards Dylan, which is another intentional fudging of the truth. He came in to speak with the therapist working with her children as part of Dylan's therapy to evaluate their relationship. He was not sent to a therapist of his own to figure out something that was wrong between him and his daughter. Woody and Mia both had regular visits with Dr. Coates to discuss Dylan and Ronan's progress, so you could just as much say that Mia was in therapy for her behavior towards Dylan. Mia said that she was concerned about Woody smothering Dylan with attention because he hardly paid any attention at all to the children Mia had from her prior marriage to Andre Previn, which, by the way, will come up again when we talk about the idea that Woody Allen was supposedly some kind of father figure to Sun Yi, when all concerned will say that in reality he hardly even spoke to her. Woody said that the reason he was paying so much attention to Dylan was that Mia was obsessed with Satchel, later to be known as Ronan, and would close herself in her room with him for long periods, ignoring Dylan, who could sometimes be found crying and alone at Mia's door. Mia says that the reason for this is that she was recovering from a difficult birth, but that hardly seems to explain it, and she also had her prior biological son, Fletcher, reportedly sleep in her bed with her until he was seven. Woody says that she told him that she had read research about tribes where the women breastfed their children as late as age seven or eight, and that she intended to do the same thing with Satchel. So it doesn't seem to be much of a stretch to say that her accusing Woody of paying too much attention to Dylan was projection on her part, but for now we'll stick to Woody and Dylan and, and leave Mia and her sons for later. So Woody agreed to see the therapist, and Coates said that she did think that his behavior toward Dylan was, quote, inappropriately intense, but only in the context of him giving Dylan too much time and attention while ignoring the other children. She repeatedly testified that she perceived no sexual element and his attention toward Dylan and never observed him acting in any sexual way toward her. This is the behavior referred to by the grossly inappropriate quote that the pharaohs repeat, knowing that it will be taken to refer to something that the therapist in question specifically stipulated that it did not mean. Coates also, incidentally, reported that an evaluation of Dylan found that she easily would be taken over by fantasy when asked to describe something as simple as an apple tree. As for Alan's therapist, Catherine Prescott, the one he was actually in therapy with, she publicly stated that Alan's profile is definitely not that of a sexual 
sexual offender. Judge Wilk's full statement reads as follows. The credible testimony of Ms. Farrow, Dr. Coates, Dr. Leventhal, and Mr. Allen does, however, prove that Mr. Allen's behavior toward Dylan was grossly inappropriate and that measures must be taken to protect her. But the idea that measures must be taken to protect Dylan from Woody directly contradicts the testimony of three out of the four people he claims support this conclusion. Even if you extrapolate from Wilk's comments some kind of evidence of Woody's guilt, in spite of the fact that that is not what Wilk said, using this one remark as evidence of Woody's guilt gives more weight to the opinion of Wilk, who did no investigation of the allegation and is contradicting the testimony of the witnesses he heard, than to the opinion of both teams of professionals who investigated the allegation extensively and had the exact opposite opinion of Wilk. As to whether Wilk is a person whose opinion deserves such weight, you can read Woody's memoir where he gives a long list of corroborated stories of people who said that their lives were ruined by Wilk's thoughtless decisions in their custody cases, and at least one woman who had Wilk preside over her case only to have him show up at her home and try to pressure her to have sex with him even though she said no one had a husband. The next big thing that the anti-Woody people love to quote is the prosecutor, Frank Mako, saying that he had probable cause to prosecute Woody but chose not to to save Dylan further trauma. For one thing, if a prosecutor really has probable cause that a serious crime was committed, they have an obligation to prosecute, otherwise they aren't doing their job. To say that they have cause but won't prosecute is a face-saving measure. It's also unprofessional for them to publish publicly imply that somebody is guilty when that hasn't yet been proven. But even beyond all that, probable cause to prosecute is not the same as somebody being guilty, otherwise we would have no need for trials. So even if he did have the probable cause that he said he did, that just means that they could have had a trial to find out if Woody did it, not that Woody actually did do it. So in no possible way does the statement indicate guilt, but it does indicate a prosecutor who is extremely biased and unprofessional, and also that the pharaohs are willing to bend the truth by trying to use this statement to imply guilt when it does no such thing. Woody actually filed a complaint against Mako for this unprofessional conduct over him making this statement. The disciplinary panel ruled Mako's statements, quote, clearly allowed reasonable people to conclude that Mako was saying that Allen was factually guilty. We are highly critical of Mako's lack of sensitivity in this case to the concept of the presumption of innocence. While at first Mako was found guilty of unprofessional conduct and reprimanded, later that reprimand was reversed, so you could side with the reprimand or the reversal. But the disciplinary panel did say that his conduct was cause for grave concern and was inappropriate, unsolicited, and potentially prejudicial. And legal experts tell testified that he violated a legal code of conduct by making his probable cause remark. At the very least, the fact that there was a hearing over this, and on one occasion his conduct was ruled inappropriate, would show that there was, shall we say, probable cause to consider that Frank Mako making this statement could be seen as, to coin a phrase, grossly inappropriate. Now, mostly everything else you hear used as damning evidence against Woody seems to be getting repeated from articles by Maureen Orth for Vanity Fair. In spite of claims that she's done many interviews and that these articles are all assiduously fact-checked, who exactly her sources were and how innuendos with only one witness can be fact-checked never seems to be completely addressed. You can better understand her involvement in the whole affair if you go back to her first article that she wrote about it for Vanity Fair in 1982, which purported to tell Mia's side of the whole story. It was so full of dubious assertions and unprovable allegations that Woody's team threatened to sue Vanity Fair for libel. Alan says he's always been a devoted father, a constant presence in his children's lives, and he's threatened a lawsuit over a recent magazine article that implied he had an unhealthy obsession with Dylan. Vanity Fair responded by blustering that Orth had interviewed over 30 sources for her piece and that it had been thoroughly fact-checked. It's true that she interviewed a number of people, but almost every one of them was an employee or personal friend of Mia, and it's true that it was fact-checked, but according to a recent interview by Orth herself, the end result of the fact-checking was actually that they decided they wouldn't publish it until after Mia Farrow wrote a handwritten letter in which she promised that if they were sued, she would testify in court that the story was true, quote, from her point of view. In other words, saying that the article was her opinion, not objectively provable fact. The kerfuffle with Woody over the article led to Vanity Fair having what I think is an easily observable agenda against him. Filmmaker Robert Whitey has said that he talked to a writer who worked there at the time who said that they would cream every time somebody brought them a story smearing Woody. To this day, you can just Google Vanity Fair and Woody Allen and see that anytime somebody has a bad word to say against Woody, within hours they'll be reporting it on their website. Since 1992, Orth has repeatedly written glowing profiles of Mia the magical supermom and pieces smearing Woody Allen, all of which she'd have you believe has nothing to do with any personal vendetta against the guy who threatened to sue over her article. She gives these pieces names like 10 Undeniable Facts, which lends them to being shared on social media by people who assume that, since the title says so, the facts must be in fact undeniable. The truth is that everything that she's written has been thoroughly rebutted and denied. But the Undeniable Facts article is written in 2014, timed to the attempts of the pharaohs to bring the case back to public attention, and among the cancel-witty internet crowd, most of whom weren't around for the original scandal and can't be bothered to read long articles 
articles on it, these 10 easily digested bullet points are the source of almost all the arguments you see against Woody. So let's go through each of them. So the first undeniable fact uh, it just says that Mia never went to the police to report the abuse that the uh, pediatrician did, and that the pediatrician is bound by law to do that. Um, I'm not sure what she means this first one to prove, except I guess it's to imply that Mia never really uh, wanted the allegation to go public. What I think is interesting about the timeline of how it got reported is that after Mia talked to Dylan about it, she first talked to her lawyer and then to a pediatrician. I mean, if you think your child has been assaulted and might be injured, do you go to a doctor first or maybe to the police or do you go to your lawyer? But the fact that she consulted a lawyer before she went to a pediatrician suggests that she would have been aware that if she brought this allegation to a pediatrician, the next thing that would happen is that that the doctor would report the allegation to the police as they'd be required to by law. The thing about this is that if Mia knew that the allegation wasn't true, then she could be charged with filing a false police report, in which case going to a doctor is exactly how she would go about getting the allegation reported without being the one to report it herself. That way she couldn't be charged with falsely reporting something. I mean, that sounds like the kind of advice a smart lawyer might give her had she asked what the repercussions would be if she went to the police with the story herself. If she didn't want the story to be reported, it's odd that she went to the doctor her twice to make sure that that's exactly what happened. Since the first time that they went, Dylan said Woody only touched her on the shoulder, and she didn't start saying she'd been assaulted until they left for a while and then came back the next day to try again. If this is meant to imply that Mia didn't want to pursue the matter and only did so because she was forced to by the pediatrician, it's also odd that, according to the testimony of Monica Thompson, a nanny who witnessed it, Mia then spent two to three days trying to get Dylan to accuse Woody on video, stopping and starting the video when Dylan wasn't saying what Mia wanted her to because, according to the nanny, Dylan seemed totally disinterested in the whole thing. If it's meant to imply that Mia's concern was for Dylan's privacy, it's also odd that Dylan is reportedly naked for much of this video as her mother was following her with the camera while she wasn't interested in talking about it. If Mia didn't want the public to know about the allegation, it's also odd that this tape of the nude Dylan was then, when Mia was reportedly the only one who had access to it, leaked to a local news station that had been reporting on the story. After their first visit to the doctor when Dylan wouldn't say that she was abused, a day went by of Mia talking to Dylan and filming her. And then after Dylan said she'd been abused at the second pediatrician visit, the next day, Monica Thompson testified that Pharaoh told her, quote, everything is okay now, everything is set, and that she seemed, quote, very happy and excited for herself. Which is, again, strange behavior if she didn't want people to know about the allegation. Also odd if Mia supposedly didn't want to publicly accuse Woody Allen of child molestation is the fact that she also briefly tried to accuse him of molesting Satchel with no evidence whatsoever until that one was so crazy that she couldn't make it stick. At one point, though Mia did offer to make the allegation go away. Four lawyers testified in court that Mia's lawyers offered to drop the matter if Woody would pay her off with $7 million. Woody refused the opportunity to settle as he maintained that he hadn't done anything wrong. Second on the list is the idea that uh, Woody Allen had been in therapy for alleged inappropriate behavior towards Dylan and that uh, Mia Farrow had instructed her babysitters that Allen was never to be alone with Dylan. I already talked about this one more extensively, but it's a distortion or outright lie to say that Woody was in therapy for this. Orth repeats this idea of Alan being in therapy for inappropriate behavior endlessly, even though she must know it's not true. And when you see people bringing up this one all the time, they're probably copy-pasting from her, or copy-pasting from somebody who copy-pasted from her. The idea that Mia instructed the babysitters not to be left alone with Alan only shows that she was trying to give people the idea that he's dangerous, which is exactly what he said himself she was trying to do. It's not evidence of anything that he did. It's also one of the main reasons the abuse allegation itself is so ridiculous, because it would have been impossible for him to do it in a house full of people instructed to watch him and when he never would have been alone with Dylan to begin with. Third on the list says that Alan refused to take a polygraph administered by the Connecticut State Police. Instead, he took one from someone hired by his legal team. The Connecticut State Police refused to accept the test as evidence. The state attorney, Frank Mako, says that Mia was never asked to take a lie detector test during the investigation. Okay, so it's a lie that Woody refused to take a polygraph test because the Connecticut State Police never asked him to do that. The reason he used a person he brought in himself to take the test is because he was volunteering to take a test that they weren't administering to him. Orth puts in the fact that Alan chose the person who administered this test to imply that it was somebody who was either unreliable or who was in Alan's pocket. In fact, Alan chose Paul Miner, who had been one of the most respected experts in the field for decades. He had been the chief polygraph examiner for the FBI. He not only taught polygraphology at the FBI Academy, he set up the entire program that they had there. Paul Miner had done polygraph tests for a huge list of famous cases, and Alan passed his test. The test was not used 
as evidence because polygraph tests are never admissible in courts as evidence. And I'm assuming Orth must know this, so this is another example of her deliberately being untruthful. Paul Miner did, however, answer questions and submit his results to the state police, and they concurred with his findings. So implying that the Connecticut police in some way rejected these findings is the second lie in that sentence. Frank Mako might say that Mia wasn't asked to take a lie detector test, but she was in fact asked by Woody's attorneys, and she refused. Yet, in spite of having something untrue in nearly every word, this one supposed undeniable fact from Orth is constantly reduced to Woody refused to take a lie detector test, and then it's repeated. I'm wondering how Orth would fare under a polygraph examination regarding her articles on Woody. So as the list goes on, a lot of the other things aren't really um, even a single fact, so much as kind of like a free association of different events that she lists together to try to make you think that there's a cause and effect between the different things that she's mentioning. And number four, she says that uh, Alan subsequently lost four exhaustive court battles, lawsuit, disciplinary action against the prosecutor and two appeals, and was made to pay more than one million in Mia's legal fees. Uh, Judge Elliot Wilk concluded that there's no credible evidence to support Mr. Allen's contention that Miss Farrow coached Dylan, or that Mrs. Farrow acted upon a desire for revenge. Now, Allen did lose the custody case for his children, but as Orth knows, that decision was not based on any conclusion that he had molested Dylan. In fact, in the judge's decision in the case, he specifically says that it's unlikely that Woody could be successfully prosecuted for abusing Dylan, and he left the possibility of Woody having custody of Dylan open for future reassessment. Since Mia had initially adopted Moses and Dylan by herself, and Woody had only recently co-adopted them, and since they were living exclusively with her, in any situation it would have been more likely for her to receive custody. Uh, with Ronan, then Satchel, uh, and then assumed to be Woody's biological child, Woody was in fact granted visitation rights. It also has nothing to do with Woody's guilt or innocence that he was required to pay some of Pharaoh's legal fees. Uh, in custody battles where one partner has more income than the other, the party with more assets is usually asked to pay the legal fees of the party with less assets, especially if the party with less income is the one given primary custody of the children and who will be raising the children. This is to prevent the party with more money from having unfair legal leverage in the custody proceedings and to make sure that the party that ends up with the kids won't be unable to care for them due to legal fees. Orth is trying to insinuate that Woody paying legal fees was some kind of penalty for some presumed guilt, which she knows isn't actually the case. The disciplinary action she's talking about against the prosecutor is Woody's complaint about Frank Mako saying that he had probable cause to prosecute, which I've already gone into in detail. But again, the question of whether or not Mako's conduct was appropriate has nothing to do with whether or not Woody was guilty or innocent of abusing Dylan, in spite of Orth slumping it here with the other judgments to try to imply that the courts ruled against him four times on the matter of abuse. She knows these other examples are irrelevant to what her readers will assume she's speaking about. It's true that Judge Wilk stated that there there was no evidence that Mia wanted revenge or that Dylan was coached, and it's also true that every expert that investigated the case said exactly the opposite of this, and that there's also mountains of evidence and endless witnesses who said that Mia wanted revenge against Woody. Wilkes' opinion is an opinion, not a undeniable fact, and it's an opinion with which all available evidence disagrees, which again Orth obviously knows. And what I don't understand is how is this crazy story of me being brainwashed and coached more believable than what I'm saying about being sexually assaulted by my father. My point out, I think Mr. Allen is, is at this point extremely upset about uh, the whole matter because he's sure, and I agree with him, that Dylan absolutely believes that this happened. Uh, because if, you're, if a memory is implanted in you when you're fragile and cannot distinguish between fantasy and reality, that sticks with you the rest of your life. Now, it's true also that the uh, woman's scorned idea is a pretty cliched way to dismiss allegations made by a woman in an acrimonious breakup. So when Woody says that Mia was out for revenge and people suggest that she could have planted the allegation, that might sound like that's all that's going on there. In this particular case, though, there's endless evidence to suggest that this is exactly what Mia was doing. Because, uh, because first of all, several weeks before it happened, Mia called me on the phone and said, um, in the course of an argumentative phone call, she said, I have something very nasty planned for you. And I said, what are you going to do, shoot me? When did this happen? This happened several weeks or a month before the allegations. This was last summer? Yes, this was a month before this happened. Um, and on many, many occasions, many occasions, over the phone and in person, um, Mia had said to me, you took my daughter and I'm going to take yours. What did she mean by that? She meant by it that I had formed a relationship with her 21-year-old daughter, and she was going to get my daughter, 
who is still and I only have one daughter, um, that's what she meant. She was going to seek Take her, her, away. her revenge that way, yes. There are many contemporaneous accounts from nannies and friends and Mia's other children that during the time after discovering Woody's affair with Suni, she would rant and rave about him and tell her other children that he was evil and satanic. Immediately after finding out about Woody's affair, Mia had a family meeting with a house full of children as young as four years old and told them that Woody had raped their sister. She also beat Suni with a phone receiver when she heard, which seems an odd way to treat somebody who's supposed to be a rape victim. The other nanny for the children, Monica Thompson, said in an affidavit, quote, since January, Miss Farrow has suffered dramatic mood swings and had screaming fits about Mr. Allen. These fits of rage were often conducted in front of the children where she would say mean and nasty things about Mr. Allen. All of the pictures of Mr. Allen in the home were destroyed. A month before the alleged incident with Dylan, Allen says he found this note on a door while he was at Farrow's house for Dylan's birthday. It reads, Child molester at birthday party. Molded then abused one sister, now focused on youngest sister family disgusted. Mia wrote that note. That's oh, yeah. her handwriting. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. I started getting phone calls all night long and death threats and, and calling me the devil and evil incarnate and, 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 and she ran out and adopted two kids and 24 hours later she was threatening my life, threatening to stick my eyes out. Did she threaten your life? She threatened my life many times. She called me and threatened my, she threatened to have me killed and to kill me. Um, and, to, and to stick my eyes out, to, to put my eyes out, to blind me. Was there ever a time when you started to think maybe she means some of this? Yeah, the, 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 uh, she, she sent me a Valentine card. Uh, she didn't send it to me, she gave it to me. Thing, and I said, oh, thanks, you know. And uh, I went downstairs, I got into my car and I opened it up and there was a very, very chilling Valentine meticulously worked on. I mean, uh, one hesitates to say psychotically worked on, you know, a, a, a Victorian Valentine and a photo of the family and through all the kids was thrust, these needles and a steak knife stuck through the heart of the thing. And uh, I got scared because, uh, you know, that was, that was one of the times that I thought, my God, this is really you know, to, if you look at the thing, it's quite frightening. Dr. Coates, Satchel's therapist who saw Woody and Mia both frequently during the course of Satchel's therapy, testified that she warned Woody at the time that she feared for his safety because of threats made by Mia. She also described the angry phone calls and the valentine with the knife in it and was convinced that Mia could harm herself or Woody. She also said that Mia described Woody as, quote, satanic and evil and that she pleaded with her to, quote, find a way to stop him. Then four days after that conversation about finding a way to stop him, Coates says Mia called her with the allegation that Dylan had been abused, and she says she was extremely puzzled because this time Mia seemed very calm, whereas in the previous conversations Mia had seemed extremely agitated. One of the reasons Dr. Leventhal gave for not believing that Dylan had been abused was that when she was interviewed, rather than talking about herself being hurt, she would often refer to what Alan had done to, quote, my poor mother. In the next one, Orth references the uh, comment by Judge Wilk about Alan's grossly inappropriate behavior. And then he also says that Mia claims that she told him uh, that she had misgivings about his behavior towards Dylan from when Dylan was two or three years old and told him that, quote, you look at Dylan in a sexual way. You fondled her. You don't give her any breathing room. You look at her when she's naked. I've also already gone into the whole grossly inappropriate line, but again, when you see these words repeated again and again, you, you see that they're most likely copy-pasted from Maureen Orth, who deliberately takes them out of context to refer to something that they weren't about. As for what she quotes Mia as saying, again, one person's opinion is not an undeniable fact, but most especially when that person who's opinion it is is the exact person whose truthfulness we're trying to determine here. In this case, the allegation that Mia was supposedly concerned about Woody looking at Dylan in a sexual way from the age of two or three makes it really kind of odd that three years later when Dylan was six, Mia enthusiastically supported Woody adopting Dylan and testified that he was a great father. She wrote a glowing, glowing letter um, or an affidavit saying that I was um, just a loving and a caring and attentive father and that I was uh, that my adopting Dylan would be great benefit to her this was her uh, sworn affidavit uh, the, you know if she thought that Woody was looking at Dylan in a sexual way for three years before that why isn't anybody asking what's wrong with this woman for doing everything she can to help Woody adopt Dylan in number six Orth says that Dylan's abuse claim is consistent with the testimony of three adults who were present that day she says on the day of the alleged assault a babysitter of a friend told police 
police and gave sworn testimony that Alan and Dylan went missing for 15 or 20 minutes while she was at the house. And then there's the claim from the other babysitter that said that she saw Alan with his head on Dylan's lap uh, while Dylan sat on the couch. And the French tutor that told police that she found Dylan not wearing her underpants under her sundress. Now on each of these details she's conflating multiple sources and they've all told conflicting versions of these stories that have changed multiple times. Christy Grodeke, the babysitter that said Dylan went missing for a time, has told different time ranges from 5 minutes to 20 minutes, none of which is actually long enough for the incident to have credibly taken place. The time when she said Dylan was out of her sight was fully accounted for by other sources anyway. And then on top of that, according to the other nanny, Monica Thompson, Grodeke changed her mind about the whole story, saying, quote, that she felt guilty for allowing Miss Farrow to say those things about Mr. Allen. Grodeke said that the day Mr. Allen spent with the kids, she did not have Dylan out of her sight for longer than five minutes, and she did not remember Dylan being without her underwear. For what it's worth, Grodeke also went on to sell her story in a tell-all book, and also to allow them to make that book into one of the trashiest TV movies you'll ever see, in which she played herself. But regardless of the source of each version, the point is that the nannies and adults have all disagreed and told different stories, so Orth's suggestion that there's some kind of consensus on a proven timeline that Moses then contradicted is simply false. Orth is also being misleading with the way that she structures the second sentence here to imply that Grodeke talked to police on the day of the assault, when in fact she didn't talk to the police until much later, and at the time she said herself that, quote, everything seemed normal that day in the house. She talked to the police and came up with the missing minutes, which she initially said that she didn't remember, after talking to Pharaoh's lawyers, when witnesses said that Mia was pressuring them to be, quote, on her side. The idea that Woody had his head in Dylan's lap is something that Woody himself has said. She was sitting on the couch and he was sitting on the floor in front of her while they were watching TV and he leaned his head against her. This was in a room full of people and full view of several witnesses. Uh, it only sounds sinister if you're working backward from the assumption that he's a monstrous pedophile and for some reason stupid enough to touch her in a sexual way in a room full of witnesses. Allison Strickland, the nanny that reported the head on the lap, obviously wasn't that concerned about it at the time because she didn't say anything about it until talking to Pascal much later that night, and Pascal didn't tell Mia about it until the next day, so she didn't seem to be that concerned about it either. And the story about Dylan not having her underpants on at some point also has at least three different versions that contradict each other about who noticed this and how and when. The idea that Dylan didn't have underpants on at some point is still not an undeniable fact, but rather the assertion of a witness. But even assuming that it was true and not something Mia concocted, it doesn't prove anything other than that at some point in a busy house with a bunch of kids running around, one kid forgot to wear underpants, which is hardly evidence that something sinister occurred, unless you're working backward again from the assumption that the alleged event happened and looking for hints. Casey Pascal even said she remembered Dylan saying that she took off her underpants because they were wet, which seems like a much more likely and commonplace explanation than an elaborate molestation scheme. They're really fond of trying to make these things sound sinister when they have perfectly innocent explanations. Dylan recently tried to make a harrowing anecdote about Woody simply sending her a care package with some old photos that he had of her. She said she asked Mia to call her lawyers and find out if this constituted harassment, which which, of course, no sane lawyer would say that it did. She tried to make it sound shady by saying that Woody used a false name on the envelope, when in actual fact the name on the envelope, Lehman, was simply the name of Woody's assistant who handled all of Woody's mail and would have been the return address on any of his letters. The next one is the typical complaints that they come up with trying to poke holes in the Yale New Haven investigation. They say that Dr. Leventhal, who signed off on the report, uh, never saw Dylan, and no psychologists or psychiatrists were on the panel. The social workers never testified, the hospital team only presented a sworn deposition by Dr. Leventhal. Then they say all the notes from the report were destroyed, and they tried to say that there are explanations for some of the things that Dylan said which were used as examples of her having a hard time telling between fantasy and reality. Like, she told them that there were, quote, deadheads in the attic, and in the attic what she was referring to were wigs kept on styrofoam blocks. The notes from the investigation being destroyed is another commonly cited fact that is most probably copy-pasted from Orth's articles, and it's as misleading as all the rest. They like like to portray this as evidence of some kind of sinister and shady goings-on, when the truth is that in investigations like this conducted by child services or by the FBI or other similar institutions, it's common practice to destroy the interview notes to protect the privacy of the interview subjects. Obviously, if the report had reached the conclusion that the pharaohs had wanted, they wouldn't be rejecting it because the interview notes had been destroyed. Judge Wilk or the police not agreeing with the results of the investigation doesn't offer evidence that it wasn't reliable, only that those particular individuals didn't like the result. Again, if the report had come to the conclusion that the pharaohs wanted, none of them would be complaining about the methodology. The facts in the report are true or not independent of how Wilk and the Pharaohs might feel about them, and along with not being seriously contested, they were reinforced by the New York investigation reaching the same conclusion. The idea that there weren't psychologists or psychiatrists on the panel is again meant to somehow imply that the Yale New Haven team isn't qualified
identified, when in fact the team investigating it had multiple doctors trained to specialize in investigating exactly this type of situation, and they also interviewed Dylan's psychiatrist as well. Their report is not the first or only time that somebody reported being concerned about Dylan's ability to distinguish fantasy from reality. It's actually one of the reasons Dylan was in therapy before any of this started. While they found out that certain things like Dylan talking about deadheads had literal explanations, neither the Yale New Haven team nor any of the other experts who interviewed her about this ever backed down from the unanimous conclusion that the abuse she described was not a real event. Then in number 8 she says Alan changed his story about the attic where the abuse allegedly took place. First Alan told investigators he had never been inside the attic where the alleged abuse took place. After his hair was found on a painting in the attic he admit that he might have stuck his head in once or twice. A top investigator concluded that his account was not credible. Now this one is so silly that it's hard to even know where to start with it. First it's never been clear that the investigators actually did find Woody's hair in the attic or if they found a hair sample how they proved that it was his. I haven't seen any evidence that a DNA test was conducted and the hair was never used as evidence. Even if they did find the hair on a painting in the attic, that doesn't prove anything, since obviously Woody's hair could have got on the painting before it was moved up there. If they were searching the space for forensic evidence that he had been up there, where he would have had to be crawling on his hands and his knees in the alleged incident, you would think that it would be impossible for him to not have left some kind of handprints, shoe prints, fingerprints, clothing fibers, or more. How do you crawl around in a tight space without touching anything? So if he was there and all they found was a hair on a painting that could have picked up his hair when it wasn't in the attic, then that's laughably thin to pass for evidence. And of course it doesn't need to be said the proof that he had been in the attic, which they never found, still doesn't constitute proof that he had molested anybody when he was there, for all Marine Earth's sinister hinting about this. As for the idea that he changed his story, all that happened was that he first said he hadn't been in the attic, in fact he wasn't even sure where it was they were talking about. He's famously claustrophobic. It's bizarre to think that he would be jamming himself into a crawl space or going through Mia's closets, which is where the entrance to the crawl space was. When he said that the police claimed that they had found hair there and rather than call the police liars, Woody said that he supposed it was possible that at some point he had stuck his head in there. He didn't say that he suddenly remembered a specific incident he had previously denied and recanted his testimony. He just said that he supposed that at some point in the 10 years or more he had visited the house, he could have stuck his head in there for some reason that he couldn't remember. He still wasn't even clear on where this crawl space was that they were talking about, and he never changed his story that it was a place that he wouldn't visit in his trips to the house. In fact, if he was guilty and he thought that they might find evidence that he had been in the crawl space, wouldn't he admit that he had been up there but create another reason for his presence there? His only reason to say that he hadn't been up there is if he thought that he hadn't. If he knew that he had been up there, then he would know that if he said that he hadn't and they found some kind of evidence that he had, it would be evidence that he was lying to them. At the time of the interview, they had already taken his fingerprints and hair samples, and he knew that they would be looking for these exact things. The only reason for him to say that he hadn't been in the attic is if he really thought that he hadn't. It's classic Orth to take these vague summaries of events and then use them to imply the exact opposite of what they actually mean. She also never specifies who the supposed top investigator is who she claims didn't find Woody credible. She just drops it in there and lets the reader's imagination create a story, which is, like all of these things she says, the exact opposite of an undeniable fact. In number 9 she comes back yet again to the probable cause comment, which a simple look at the circumstances shows isn't in any way indicative of guilt or innocence, but was definitely unprofessional and misleading. Orth's continued attempts to try to use a statement to indicate something other than what it actually indicates is, however, indicative of her willingness to bend facts that don't suit her. In number 10 she spends a lot of words to say that she's not a friend of Mia Farrow and that she never met Mia Farrow before 2003. This is another item on the list that doesn't have anything to do with Woody Allen's guilt or innocence, but you can see why it's here, since Orth's long-time obvious bias to one side of the story makes many people assume that she must be friends with Mia. Her first large piece on Mia specifically bills itself as telling you Mia's side of the story, and the witnesses she has interviewed or claimed to have interviewed are almost exclusively Mia's friends and employees. Vanity Fair's defense of her article when Woody threatened to sue for libel is that she had interviewed so many people to research it, but obviously if she had been acting with the opposite agenda because she could have found just as many people who were friends and employees of Woody who would have said the opposite. Of course it doesn't make much sense that almost everybody who has spoken publicly about the case on Mia's side would all coordinate to speak to this one interviewer for the same article without any of them first consulting with Mia or making sure it was okay with her. But if it's actually true that Orth is not friends with Mia and wrote the article without Mia's approval then it only makes it even less professional and more biased that she was claiming to be telling Mia's story and to speak on Mia's behalf. Regardless it's manifestly dishonest for her to imply that what she's written doesn't represent propaganda from Mia's side, when Mia herself wrote a letter about Orth's first article personally promising to testify that it did, in fact, represent her opinion. But in spite of all that, Orth did hit on something with this 10 undeniable facts format though, as these sound bites perfectly fit the attention span of today's readers and are ready made for social media dissemination. So no matter how little sense they make, you will find these 10 non-facts used anytime you try to talk about this on a public forum. Of course, as I've already said, an anecdotal assertion of a single witness, oftentimes a witness who Maureen Orth won't even 
Maureen name is not in any way an undeniable fact. Maureen Orth's Vanity Fair articles are an endless deluge of assertions about private lives of the people involved, which are often quoted and repeated, but have no sources other than Maureen Orth's articles. When she's put upon to explain where certain things come from, Orth often refers to a, quote, member of the household or just unnamed sources. Almost exclusively, the sources that Orth does name in her articles about Mia are all Mia's friends or employees, and yet she has the bald hypocrisy to imply that it's shady when people who work with Woody say that they support him. So I can't know what's going on in Dylan Farrow's head. And while judging the event on the evidence we have, it's not only unlikely, but basically impossible that it happened, that doesn't mean that Dylan doesn't think what she's saying is true. Many, many past cases have shown us how easy it is to give people, and especially vulnerable children, false memories that they sincerely believe are true. When Sandy Bullock was working in the Farrow house, she said that she once found Dylan crying, and when she asked her what was wrong, Dylan said, Mommy wants me to lie. If Dylan had a story fed to her or was prompted to make one up during a traumatic family ordeal at the impressionable age of seven, and then was made to spend months repeating that story to various psychologists and investigators, it would actually be surprising if she didn't remember the story as being true, whether or not it had ever happened. But where Dylan starts to lose me is with how willing she is as an adult to freely distort the story and add things that she has to know are untrue when it serves her purpose. Because I have been saying this. I have been repeating my accusations unaltered for over 20 years. She said, from then on, my story has never, ever wavered. Yeah. Right. And, and when you look at that, that's true. That's key. Yeah. The fact that it's been 20 years and she's told the same story consistently over yeah. time. And as you point out, Emery, in hindsight, you look back at some of the details that she told you there and you go, oh. The biggest falsehood that Dylan and Ronan routinely state is that her story has never changed over the years. Like I already showed, almost every single detail of it has changed. First, there are the details that I already said, like the location of the alleged assault being changed at least three times. The details of what Woody is supposed to have done to her have all changed many times. Then there was the first time that Dylan told a doctor that it hadn't happened, but that wasn't the only time she said that. According to their nanny, Dylan again decided a couple months later on October 30th that it hadn't happened. Dr. Leventhal with the Yale New Haven team testified that she also initially told them that Woody hadn't touched her vaginal area, then said that she had, and then again that he hadn't. That brings us to a minimum of four separate occasions when she said that the abuse didn't happen at all. And you got Oh. Now, of course, as a child, probably scared and nervous and confused, it would make sense for her story to be confused and changing. But as an adult, she doesn't have that excuse, so why does she say it hasn't changed when she knows that it has? And why does she keep changing it? Every time she's told the story as an adult, there have been changes and new, colorful embellishments. The most noticeable of these is the train set she says was in the attic during the incident, which was never mentioned in any of the accounts prior to 2014, but which she now makes the centerpiece, dramatically saying that she's never been able to look at trains again. First, as her brother, who was there in 14 years old at the time is described in detail, the attic in question was actually more of a small crawl space, which he said at a low ceiling was full of boxes, exposed nails, mothballs, and mouse droppings. He insists that the children were never allowed to play up there, and so the idea that of there being an operational train set up there for some reason is fairly ridiculous. Filmmaker Robert Whitey, who researched the case extensively when he directed a documentary on Woody Allen, went one step further. In 2018, he offered Ronan and Dylan Farrow $100,000 if they could provide any verification of several statements that they had been peddling, which he believed were obviously false. He was willing to bet $100,000 that not only could they not provide a picture of any such train set, but that they couldn't even provide a picture of an electrical outlet in the crawl space with which to plug in this train set, which Dylan says was running during her assault. Now, Mia Farrow still owns the house, by the way. It would be simple to snap a picture of the attic if it would show what Whitey asked for. Then there's the fact that, like most of the details about the assault, you can debunk it with simple common sense. In the story, supposedly in the space of 10 to 20 minutes, Woody is getting Dylan to race upstairs with him through a closet, up into a crawl space, and then he also takes time to turn on a noisy electric train set that people looking for Dylan might have heard. It seems more than abundantly clear that the train set was added to the story as a theatrical flourish. When Dylan talked to Maureen North about it in 2013, she didn't mention a train set, but she said that to that day she still couldn't listen to jazz music because of what Woody had done to her. Then, a few months later, when Dylan wrote her editorial where the train set was first mentioned, she uses almost identical language to say that, to that day, she still can't look at train sets. Is it more likely that this train set existed in this dangerous crawl space with no electricity where the kids weren't allowed to play? Or that Dylan decided that, since the actual story of what Woody is accused of is so thin that it couldn't even fill up a blog, a little added detail might spruce it up and make it more convincing? Like I said before, I think it's quite possible that Dylan does believe that the abuse happened, even if it didn't, but if her mission is all about the truth coming coming out, not about an agenda, then why is she so willing to play fast and loose with the details? In 2014, when all this started coming up again, I was perfectly willing to believe that Dylan and Ronan knew things that maybe we didn't. But since then, the most convincing evidence I found of Woody's innocence has been the Pharaoh's own behavior. The train set is only one of many times when Dylan has stretched or invented facts in the last few years. So find out. I mean, it's, it's really, like I said, it's, it's so easy. 
in this day and age. Dylan likes to ask why Me Too has spared Woody Allen, and she knows the answer to this also. The legal authorities gave full attention to the case at the time no evidence was found, and they rendered a decision that no crime had been committed, so he went on with his life. That used to be what happened when people were accused of a crime, and we needed more than an accusation and an angry mob on Twitter to find them guilty. Dylan and Ronan also frequently harp on the idea that Woody was in therapy for his behavior toward Dylan, which I've also already shown in detail isn't true. Either they know that this wasn't true too, or they're lecturing the world on how you should listen to them when they haven't even googled the case themselves. So find out. Dylan also repeats the lie that Alan refused to take a polygraph. I'm guessing that here she's parodying Maureen North like so many others, but again, either she knows that it's a lie, or she hasn't even bothered to learn the basics of her own story. So find out. Dylan also likes to repeat the probable cause remark, which has also been thoroughly debunked as any kind of evidence that Woody was guilty. She paints it as untrue that Mia's accusations against Woody came during a custody dispute because Woody sued for custody only after the abuse allegation was made, but this is also simply untrue since they were already in negotiations over custody and support payments for the children. Woody did sue for custody after the allegation because he says that then he realized the situation with Mia was becoming dangerous to the children, which I would say was a good call. He's totally false and outrageous allegations have sickened me so that I felt that for the sake of all my three children, I must try and remove them from an atmosphere so unhealthy it can surely leave irreparable scars. Dylan says that the author of the Yale New Haven report never interviewed her. This is carefully worded to imply that the report was made by people who didn't interview her. In fact, it's a matter of public record that they did interview her nine times. When she says that the author of the report didn't interview her, she's talking about Dr. Leventhal, but the interviews with Dylan were conducted by Dr. Julia Hamilton and Jennifer Sawyer, the two other social workers handling the case. As for obvious reasons with a young female subject, they would typically have a female interviewer. Dylan has also said that the other witnesses to the case weren't interviewed. Of course, the assault itself couldn't have had any witnesses, but if she's just referring to other people who were at the house or had pertinent information, the investigation did in fact interview Christy Grodeke, their nanny that day, and Sophie Burge, the French tutor who was also there that day, along with Susan Coates and Nancy Schultz, the two therapists who had talked to Dylan about it. They also interviewed Mia and just about every other conceivable person that could have had anything to do with it. Incidentally, in his memoir, Woody tells a detailed story with witnesses about when he and Mia were being interviewed by the team together and she was caught red-handed inventing anecdotes about the incident out of whole cloth. Dylan and Ronan also love to portray Woody as a wealthy Hollywood mega power with unseemly control over the media, when they know that for the major studios in Hollywood, all of Woody's movies put together have probably generated less profit for them over the years than an ice cream stand at one of their amusement parks. They talk about Woody's powerful legal team when Mia's lawyer during the custody proceedings happens to have been Alan Dershowitz, who is still to this day one of the most famous attorneys in the country. You probably just saw him all over the TV during Trump's impeachment proceedings. But of course where Dylan really starts to strain credibility is in how she's constantly going on about how she's been ignored, disbelieved, or discarded. Dylan Farrow says she has felt ignored for years after alleging that her adopted father, Woody Allen, sexually abused her. Why shouldn't I feel some sort of <sighs> outrage that after all these years being ignored and disbelieved and tossed aside, I have been systematically shut down, ignored, or discredited. The obvious fact is that not only was her allegation taken seriously and listened to, she was listened to to a degree that would have been completely absurd for anybody who wasn't from a family full of celebrities. Believe it or not, I didn't think I was that famous to, to warrant such coverage. I was on magazine covers. I thought, you gotta be kidding, I'm not that big a deal to warrant this interest. But apparently it was a good, juicy story, a very juicy story. And, um, you know, it, 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 it took a little edge off my natural blandness. Every detail of the case was nightly news for months. There were endless investigations into it, even more than I've detailed here. And that's all just at the time. Even after the case was dropped for 28 years, anytime Dylan has wanted to talk about it, she's instantly had access to major media outlets. She can come on TV and talk about a 28-year-old story in front of millions of viewers anytime she feels like it. Now she has a book coming out, and if you think that this book wasn't published purely because of who she is and the fact that she can have anything published she wants, I encourage you to go read the excerpt on the Vanity Fair website and then try to say with a straight face that it was published because of its literary merits. For survivors of sexual assault who have actually been ignored and disregarded, I would think that for Dylan to pretend she has been treated like they have been treated would be extremely insulting.